Here we go. So we'll give people about three minutes to hop on. I'm not really sure how many we're expecting live tonight, and then we will get started. Aiden, where is your team based out of? Okay, so we're gonna get started. Thank you for joining our virtual software seminar. This is the first year we're doing something like this. So we're very excited to see how it goes. Um, our expectation is during these, it'll be a graciously professional event while representing our teams. So please contribute to that kind of environment. I'm Laura, I just graduated from team 4061 this last June. We have several other students and mentors from my team and a handful of other teams also here. So I'm going to be doing the first presentation tonight on code organization. Do we have any questions before we jump in? Oh yeah. Can you hear me? We get some feedback. A bunch of us in the same room. Okay. Sounds good. Um, if you could put your team number, please, after your name, that would help us keep track of who is here. And we will be monitoring the chat as best we can. We'll also have a questions period after each presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can you see that? Okay, I'm getting feedback from people not the call. Well, that works. <laughs> okay, so this is going to be a bit of a explanation of how we choose to organize our code so that it's easier for us to work with. Other teams have other ways of doing it, but a lot of these will be similarities across several teams that have been using this type of language for the last several years. So the reason why we organize our code is that it allows multiple of our programmers to work at the same time. We can each work in a different file and then merge our changes together cohesively rather than working on top of each other or trying to work on a single computer. It also makes our code a lot more readable, which is great for us because we can tell what our code is doing, but also great when we need to get help because another team can come in and easily tell what our code is doing and where 
and know how to help us debug it. It makes it easier for us to expand our code. If we want to add a new subsystem or add some more capabilities, we can go and expand on the files already there or create new versions of them without having a complicated web to work with. And it being modular lets us make changes on the fly. So this last season, we changed our intake design partly through the build season, and it allowed us to remove the old subsystem and add the new one seamlessly without a lot of issues. There are five main types of files that we use that we're gonna talk about tonight. The first one is subsystems. We also have commands, constants, the drive team interface file, which is probably named probably unique to us, but the function will be similar with other teams and robot container file. So a subsystem is a unit of code that controls a section of the robot. So that section could be your intake, could be the arm, could be the drive base, kind of like your mechanical map subsystems. On our team, we do that as well as the software. Only one command can run on a subsystem at a time because your intake or arm can't be doing two things at once. This helps us organize how motors and sensors are controlled because we can say which ones belong to which part of the robot. It also lets us apply motor and movement limits. So we can tell the arm is not allowed to rise above this point because it'll break. And so that code can control that to keep our robot safe. It also allows us to enable and disable each section of our robot. And that's a feature we implement because it allows us to have a lot safer operation. So we can be a demonstration maybe for youth and disable the drive base while still operating everything else on the robot. Commands are what makes the robot do something or the subsystem do something. We, the, each command can use multiple subsystems, even though each subsystem can only run one command at a time. And we can chain and group commands. So the robot can do multiple things in series or at the same time. This is really useful for easy buttons, which is what we call it when we press a control, the driver presses a control, and the robot does some series of tasks that is a useful function in the game. So this could be lining the arm up to score, could be climbing in some cases, things like that, and autonomous, which is basically a series of easy buttons or a big one where we drive and then manipulate a game piece. There's also commands to tell the subsystem when to run a motor and when to stop running the motor. And then the subsystem makes sure we are within those safety bounds that we placed. So this is an example of a change command construction. So here we have a command group that is letting us run multiple commands in series or in sequence. So here we are running one command until something else happens, or we can run a command and name it, or we can run it and tell it when to stop. And so these, Carl probably knows more about this, but what are these called, Carl? Right. So, so these are called um, command decorators, and they are, you need a mute, Laura. Um, they are a way to um, construct sequences of commands and um, conditional commands, looping commands, without having to subclass the um, the library classes of WPI Lib. They were they were they've been added over the last couple of years, and they result in a very uh, readable way of constructing commands without having to make a lot of uh, files to express each command that you want to do. You could just sort of build them out of components this way. Muted, but my volume was up. As one example of how you can group commands, we can also make command groups that can either be sequential, so commands happen in order, or parallel, which means they happen at the same time. So subsystems and commands work together to make the robot do something. So the subsystem tells the robot how to move and what limits to not move past for safety or control reasons. And the command tells the robot when to move and when the movement is done. The constants file is a little bit different because it doesn't directly have the robot do something. It stores the values the other part of the code needs. We often use this for max speeds and limits. So maybe that's the angles that the arm can safely be at. So that sets our limits within the subsystem. We organize these by the subsystem that they primarily affect. That way it's just easier to read. We can go to a specific section that's applicable. 
And this puts all the values in a single location for calibration. So that way, if we change something on the arm, we can go up to the shoot with the grid and say, okay, where do we, these positions need to be? Change all the numbers to be correct now, and it's all in one file instead of having to go hunt them down in the subsystems. This is an example of our constants. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail because these are just specific to our robot. But as you can see, it is a bunch of values, mostly doubles that relate to different functions of a robot that we wanted easily accessible here. Oh, you can also see comments. Comments are very important in the constants file because otherwise you end up with a lot of names that either get very long or are very difficult to remember what they're for. Drive team interface is what names the driver controls and tells us what controllers the driver and operator will be using. So that could be an Xbox controller or some other kind of joystick or maybe a button box or whatever you decide to use. Um, it also is where we house the enable switches for each subsystem with overrides. So that means on some sort of dashboard, which Carl's maybe gonna be showing later, we can say, oh, actually we want this enabled even though we don't have the button box there. So we don't use that in a match, but that can be useful for testing so that we don't have to have all of the physical controllers. We can do it on the dashboard, on the computer. This is an example of part of our drive team interface file. As you can see, we tell it that we're using these joysticks and here's a header we use on the dashboard. And we store some, you could call them constants in here because they're just saying what kind of controllers we're using. They're not values that are related to the robot as much. And we have our enable switches also in here. Robot container is where the subsystems commands and driver controls are. It stores them. Um, it produces a map of everything a robot can do. So we have every command in there, we can see all our abilities and we have every subsystem. So also everything that's part of the robot. Um, it can be used to produce robot software control mappings documentation, which is the file that we make that has like the RoboVO and what every port is going to have but it also has the driver controls. And so we can have a controller and say the A button does this command, the B button does this. And so that will be aligned with the robot container. And that way it's a little easier to read than the code and also helps our drivers learn and other teams help us and other team members operate the robot safely. Carl, do you wanna talk about some common pitfalls with this design? Sure. I will say a few words about common pitfalls. Okay. okay. All right, well, we before we question. do that, uh, I'm told we should ask for questions. So um, you can put a question in the chat or you could um, pipe up and uh, speak, but uh, please do remember to remove, to mute yourself um, after, uh, that. So it looks like Caden has a question. So go ahead. Not hearing you. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. If, if you have, if you have a question and we're not hearing, I, I, there we go. Okay. Keep your microphone is a little difficult to understand. If you want to try typing that in the chat, that would be helpful. So, so we're not here.
Okay, I think a bunch of us are on the same Wi-Fi and it crashed. So we are back now. <laughs> and okay, some of us are back now and not on the same network anymore. So Caden, if you want to try to say your question again or just type it. Oh, okay. I muted. I think I'm not muted. I think my volume is. The microphone. Okay. Can someone who is not on my team in the meeting hear me? Can I get a reaction or something? Not promising. Okay. So I think we need to. Okay, Josiah says he can hear me, so we're going to progress. Carl, do you just want to come over here to talk about pitfalls? Okay. I'm on a different Hi. I, okay, thank you. Hi, so I'm Carl, uh, one of the software mentors. Um, common pitfalls. So, so Laura talked about an architecture in which the, um, the commands uh change settings in the subsystems and then the subsystems do things um and we struggle every year to actually achieve that architecture it's it's very easy to have your commands actually issue um issue operations to the motors for example and we just have to get better at um at making sure that um uh, we design our subsystems such that the the commands are changing settings in the subsystem, and it's the periodic method of the subsystem that um, that actually controls the motors. Second thing is um, it's very important, um, and again we struggle with this uh, that when a command ends, it actually actively commands the subsystem to stop if if that's that's the normal thing i mean I, I can imagine there are situations in which a command will end and not do that but but usually you want to make sure the command the, the command the subsystem stops running when the command ends um and for some reason that's it's been something that over the years we have uh, we have had to work really hard on to get that right, and we still get it wrong in one or two subsystems every year. It seems um, so. So the thing you got to remember is that just because you're not telling a motor what to do, uh, that it's going to stop. It, it's rather the motor is going to keep doing what the last thing you told it to do was, and and that's probably not what you want. So that's pitfall number two. Pitfall number three has to do with um, compound commands such as sequential commands and parallel com sequential command groups and parallel command groups uh, that typically involve the drive subsystem. There's a feature in WPI Live that is turned on for the tank drive and the mechanum drive uh, drive subsystem libraries that says if the motors for those are not getting uh, updates every 100 milliseconds or so, then they're going to start issuing uh, error messages about uh, watchdog not fed, fed. And unfortunately, it's the uh, it's sort of built into the architecture of these parallel command groups. If the drive base is doing some, if you're doing a command group that has the drive base doing something and some other subsystem doing something, and the drive base finishes first, there's no command running on the drive base, at which point the, um, the watchdog not fed errors start popping up. And this isn't too terrible because usually what this means is that you wanted the drive subsystem to stop anyway, and that's what the watchdog is going to do. The main annoyance is that it uh, produces a lot of error messages that you may find surprising and concerning. Um, 
and also they those do take up bandwidth on the network in in uh, constrained network environments. So um, there's not really any good workaround for this. Some people advise turning off the uh, watchdog not fed messages. Personally, I prefer that they be there because I think they help uh, prevent runaway robots in the presence of uh, certain kinds of errors. So those are the three main pitfalls that I think of. Uh, are there uh, questions about this or about anything else in the, in the presentation? What? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> One of my one of my other uh, mentors here is uh, re reminding me that another pitfall is that if you put commands into command groups, uh, you can't reuse the command. A command can be only in a command instance can only be in one command group. So you have to make multiple if you're going to stick them into multiple groups. Okay, I think that's probably all. Any questions? Uh, and if you do want more information on like how to make commands, um, there is documentation that first puts out, WPL puts out about that. Well, they're saying yes, they can hear me. So that okay. is. All right. Well, uh, I don't see anything else then. Cool. Do you want to see if you can get your Zoom back up? Yeah. Maybe on your hotspot or something? Um, Mine's back up. Okay. Okay. Now let me go see. I'm going to go back to my computer and see if you can. Cool. I'm going to stop sharing while we'll wait in. Do we have any questions, comments? Does anyone have experience using this kind of thing? Maybe you do it differently. Yep. Tell people that what's on. You can actually show almost a driver. That's true. So while we're waiting for Carl to get rebooted up, we'll show oh, here comes Carl. But this is the driver station that we use. So I talked about in the Michaela, you can hold this. I talked about in the drive team interface that we had light your button box. So these were our easy buttons this year. So you can press one of those and the arm will get to a certain position. And then we use Xbox controllers or a Logitech version of Xbox controllers. Usually we've used other things in the past. And so each button will be in the drive team interface and bound to a command. We also can use the dashboard and things like this. It's one of smart dashboard. We can use other things as well. And that's where we can control the enable switch overrides. And if we don't have the physical enable switches like we do here. I'm also gonna show the robot really quick because Carl's gonna talk about some data regarding that. So this is our robot this year. So <laughs> sorry, I've got a few people. So we have an intake, which can do cubes and cones. And then we had a four bar linkage arm and then sort of drive. And that's more or less it as far as subsystems go. We did have a hand, but we replaced the rollers for that. So I think Carl is getting back in and ready. OK, so I will so, hand this off. Um... Are people hearing me? Um, you can hear me, good. Okay, so let's see if I can do all the things I need to do here. Um, share my screen. The thing I'm going to share, oh, I wanna share the whole screen. Okay, seeing that, it looks like. Good, so I'm going to talk about uh, some of our experience with dashboards and data logging, um, some of the techniques that we've used, and again, some, some gotchas along the way. Um, and, oh goodness. So uh, I'm gonna talk about how to put data on dashboards, um, what the code looks like for doing that. I'm going to talk about uh, dash, particular dashboard programs that are useful for what we call diagnostic use. 
uh, and then uh, dashboard programs that are that are appropriate for competition. Um, there are quite a few trade-offs there that um, that are worth knowing about. And then uh, once we've taken a look at the dashboard situation, um, we'll look into how to enable data logging on your robot, which became uh, very easy in 2023. Um, and then we'll look at how to analyze the data that has been logged. So hopefully I can make this uh, computer talk to the robot at all the appropriate times to, to do this and still not get too lost in the presentation. So we'll go on to the next slide. Um, so, um, to put data on the dashboard, there are a number of ways of doing it. Um, the way that we use almost exclusively is to use the smart dashboard class that lets you put values of uh, all different types onto the dashboard with a key. Um, and then the key becomes the thing that you look at to see uh, to match up the value with what's going on in your in your robot program. Um, as I said, all types of values. Um, uh, something called sendables. Uh, commands are sendables, uh, an instance of commands. Uh, the WPI Live documentation actually strongly encourages people to uh, put commands on dashboards and then run the commands from the dashboard. Um, we found that that was pretty dangerous in 2023 because often you could start a command and then when you click the button that said stop, it wouldn't stop and you'd have to click it multiple times. And that was um, uh, pretty dangerous. But um, I've recently submitted some changes uh, for WPI Live that should make that not be a problem in the future. Uh, we'll see there are there are major changes going on in the network tables protocol and implementation libraries uh, in WPI Live over this summer. So lots of um, lots of things going on in this space. But I think I think at least the commands will work better next year. Um, I wanted to say a word about choosing the keys for dashboard values. Um, the the smart dashboard class uh, with its put number put boolean things allows you to um, to give keys a hierarchical structure just like in the file system you have thing slash thing slash thing um, and we're going to see when we look at the glass dashboard how that um, how that uh, I don't have my video turned on. There. Okay. <laughs> I'm I'm making gestures with my hands and I realize you're not seeing them. They might be important. They might not. Um, uh, so hierarchical naming things slash things slash thing. Um, just like in a file system. Um, now here's a little gotcha. The glass dashboard will show those things in the hierarchy. And we're gonna see that when we look at the glass dashboard here in a second. But smart dashboard and shuffleboard only show things that have single level names. So this is very frustrating because we put lots of stuff on our dashboards, but probably 100 or 200 different things. Um, and we get to the smart dashboard and we say they're not there. Um, well, that just seems to be a limitation, but there's that there's a trick that you could take advantage of because of this behavior. Um, and that is, since Smart Dashboard and Shuffleboard will only show you things at the top level, just put the things that your drivers need to see at the top level, and then put other stuff that they don't need to see at lower levels. And that way, you can take advantage of this kind of weird behavior to actually do something useful. Oops, wow, this goes really fast. Um, finally, um, Glass puts, puts uh, keys in alphabetical order. So it's important to choose keys well. So, so um, we started out with keys that read like swerve, front left and swerve, rear left. Um, 
sorry, we didn't start with those. That's where we ended up with. Uh, those put the put the the modules data together. Whereas if you say front left swerve and right rear left swerve, those are going to be separated in glass, and you won't be able to see them together. So that's a, another little trick that's handy. Okay. So here's an example of how we put some data on the um, dashboard on. Uh, on whatever dashboard, uh, the smart dashboard class puts data on any dashboard. That's, this is why it's confusing. Smart dashboard is also a program uh, that runs, but the smart dashboard class is a way to, to interface with any dashboard. Very confusing. Um, so uh, armconstants.karm slash is something out of the constants file that we refer to constantly when we put things on the dashboard from within the ARM subsystem to make sure that they all start with the same prefix. And that's important, likewise, for getting the things related to the ARM to all be together. Um, I'm noticing here's a bad, this is actually a bad example here in the um, last two lines. We have upper extension and lower extension. Those are going to get separated by other values um, because there are lots of things between L and U. Whereas if we named them extension upper or extension hyphen upper, extension hyphen lower, they would get put together. So um, that's a good trick. Okay, so um, that was about putting things on the dashboard. Now, how about the dashboard programs? Um, I, we like to distinguish between the diag diagnostic dashboards and the competition dashboards. On your diagnostic dashboard, you want to put lots and lots of data. You want to put what direction your swerve modules are pointing, what direction the robot is going, what the angle of the arm is right now, what the angle of the what the tilt angle is, what the current is, what the voltage is. You know, you want lots and lots of things on your diagnostic dashboard because that, that's going to be very helpful when things go wrong and, and you need to see what's happening. Um, you also need on your diagnostic dashboard to be able to set values, turn things on and off. Um, it's not, it's not, uh, something that distinguishes the dashboard programs themselves so much, but uh, some of the techniques for uh, interacting with them in the code is, is more where that happens. Um, having plots is very helpful. Uh, we, uh, Laura showed you the uh, intake grabber on this robot. Um, that grabber was implemented over the course of just a couple of weeks between a couple of competitions. Over one, a course of one week between one competition and the next. Um, and it was important to get appropriate current limits for the motors and the plots were very helpful in doing that. Likewise, the plots were very helpful in um, recording measurements that would let us implement easy buttons for setting the arm angle and extension uh, to make it easy to deliver cones or cubes to the different levels in the in the, uh, substation. That's what it was called. So um, diagnostic diagnostic dashboards, uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, glass is the easiest one to use. A shuffleboard is a kind of maybe advantage scope, which I'll talk about later as far as as far as analyzing data logs, can also be used as a uh, diagnostic dashboard, but we've never done that. So uh, I don't have anything to say about that. But I thought I would show you some examples of glass here in a second. So to invoke uh, the glass dashboard, um, darn it, mouse is super, there we go, super sensitive. Excuse me. So um, I'm going to show you a demo of glass in a second. Um, it's adequate. Uh, I don't think it's terribly pretty. Uh, but it does the job and we're pretty happy to have it compared with uh, not having it. So um, I think it's fine. Um, 
So I'm going to show you this here in a second, if I can figure out how to do this. So here we go. So to invoke glass, um, yeah, to invoke glass, uh, you can just go to uh, the W menu in your VS Code, uh, Start Tool, and Start Class. Pop up here in a second. And um, first thing you want to do is configure it. Um, oh, yes. Uh, you, you need to be connected to the robot network to have this work. Um, and uh, there are a number of ways of entering the address, internet address of the of the uh, robot. Uh, currently, if you have the driver station running, it can just get the robot address from that. So that's nice. Um, you have a choice of N network tables three or N network tables four. I'm going to switch it to N network table four and see if it will misbehave in the way that it frequently did this year uh, when I applied that. Um, yep, <laughs> success. See it, it's it's connecting and then it's disconnecting and it's connecting and it's disconnecting. This is a bug. Um, and uh, if this happens to you, the solution is very simple. Just switch it to network tables three and apply and then all should be well. Okay, so that was um, that was about configuring it. The other thing that I find extremely annoying about Glass is that its choice of the default font is small enough that I can at least cannot distinguish between the character zero and the character eight. <laughs> so um, you can adjust the zoom. And that will help you with that problem. Um, well, I'd go crazy with that. All right, so we don't need to keep that around. Then, um, as you see, uh, we'll just scroll down. I'm going to scooch this over so I can see it. I suspect you can see it better than I can at the moment. Um, uh, you see that um, that there are um, different top-level keys. The live window key is one that we have not used it's automatically populated with stuff uh, that will become active when the robot is in test mode it's not a feature that we've explored and used very much so uh, we'll just minimize that you see how it minimizes everything that you put on with the smart dashboard class is going to be under the smart dashboard key and you'll see that we have them organized by subsystem we have the arm subsystem the drive base the driver station, the grabber. And for some reason, we have our swerve modules under a different key. And you can put on things like uh, the robot uh, uh, voltages, the top level system voltages. And then we have a, we have a feature built into our uh, build system that records the um, git commit hash of every uh, deployed code that we put on the robot and that shows up on the dashboard as well. Uh, very handy for asking after a match, well, which code was I really running during that match? Um, there's a discussion on Chief Delphi, I believe, about different ways of doing this. Uh, and uh, I think it may be a, a standard feature of WPI Lib next year. Um, okay, so what I wanted to show was um, the grabber current um, and use of a plot. So, what? Yeah, we need a game piece and we need a plot. So, to make a plot, um, do a new plot window, you add a plot, and then just drag the Thing that you want to plot over onto that. Over on the and and I think there's something bogus going on with the motor controller or something because it's reporting 0.3 amps continuously. 
um, has been for a couple of weeks. I don't know why. Um, make this bigger. And then you can, oh, you can zoom the uh, vertical scale. Um, and since I know that our grabber is going to draw about somewhere between 40 and 60 amps, we'll zoom it uh, like that. You can drag it since currents are going to always be positive. Um, and similarly, you can zoom the, uh, oh, not when it's going. Okay. All right. So, and then, uh, but I still don't have my zero. There it is. Okay. Um, so, our teammates are over there at the robot. Um, <laughs> Laura's going to show you what's going on uh, in her window. And so, Are we ready? So, um, for another reason, I'm going to enable the robot. And then I'm going to that. And when I press the intake and outtake, um, currently they're just running freely. We're in cone mode. So now she's going to put a cone in, and you see how the how the current shoots up, but but also see that it that it limits itself at a certain value, and the figuring out what those limits should be was a trial and error process that we used this last plotting dashboard for. We would we would put a cone in um, when it was grabbing well enough, um, then we could set a current limit at that point and then test it to make sure that it still would grab well enough. So that's a very important feature of glass and very useful and available to all teams now. When I started with this team uh, five years ago, we had our own implementations of a lot of this kind of stuff. And it was uh, a big headache to maintain. And now it's part of WPI Live and everybody can do it, which I think is pretty wonderful. I'll give it back to you. I just gave it back to her. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Uh, so I think we can go back to the presentation if I can find it. Disable the robot. Uh, all right, so um, competition dashboards. So the considerations for the competition dashboards are rather different. Um, you want to have low resource use on the Robo Rio, on the network and on the driver station. And unfortunately there is, uh, oh, and, and you want to therefore focus on what the drive team really needs to see and do with the dashboard. And for us, that has meant um, uh, primarily autonomous selection and seeing one or two camera streams from the robot. Um, the drivers uh, just need that typically in order to do things. If they, Because you want them, um, now I get a message about my internet connection is unstable, so I hope this works. Um, it, he, at least our experience is the driver team wants to be able to focus on the robot, uh, focus on what it's doing, focus on what they're doing with it, and they don't want to know anything about currents or voltages or anything. Um, uh, later, uh, you'll look at the logging data and maybe figure this out. So shuffleboard and smart dashboard are, are probably the most common um, competition dashboard choices. Um, so Shuffleboard is the newer of the two, uh, written in Java, has lots of widget types available, has lots of ability to interactively uh, choose which values get put on the dashboard. Um, a feature that we've never used is that within the robot program, uh, you can actually lay out your shuffle. I shouldn't say we've never used that. We used to use that. We didn't use it this year. Um, you can lay out the dashboard uh, from within the robot program. 
um, and and that can be pretty nice. Um, but we had a lot of trouble this year with um, resource use by shuffleboard. Uh, driver station, um, CPU, and network were all uh, sort of off the charts sometimes and very difficult to, to diagnose uh, to the point where we didn't succeed in diagnosing those problems. Uh, one good thing about Shuffleboard is that it has relatively easy to adjust camera stream uh, controls so you can balance your bandwidth and video quality <laughs> of your video streams um, just by moving some sliders and, and that's pretty nice. Um, it's not very well supported. Um, but that has to be taken in conjunction with the situation with Smart Dashboard, which is even less well supported. Uh, it um, had not really been updated since WPI Live 2021, um, and nobody was working on it. Uh, so we saw some flaky behavior. Uh, with Smart Dashboard, the main thing being that our autonomous chooser would just not show up on the dashboard um, sometimes. Uh, turned out that every time rebooting the driver station computer and rebooting the uh, RoboRio cured that, so we survived, but it was not pleasant and it was pretty scary. Uh, the camera stream parameters on Smart Dashboard are only adjustable by entering some magic strings into a certain field of the camera viewer. Um, actually, I think I probably can show that um, here in a second. Um, so, so that's pretty unpleasant um, and makes it hard to experiment. Uh, the layout is determined just by dragging things around on the on the dashboard, and uh, then they get saved locally. So, let me see if. I have no, I don't. Of course I don't. Uh, can you can you come come show that by pointing your camera at the smart dashboard? Probably it's not gonna work terribly well. What's that? Uh well it, it's showing on her. It's just tiny. I'll stop. Yeah. Oh. oh, I. Uh, maybe I can. Maybe I can do it. So thank you for bearing with us as we learn about this technology. <laughs> anyway, so now we're going to show the above the above the driver station program is the smart dashboard and unfortunately you can't really see you can see the camera that the camera stream is there but you can't see the uh, text that's on it there's a bit of gray at the top left that's the chooser and um it seems to have come up this time so that's fine okay thank you i will share again Okay, so that's Smart Dashboard. So we ended up using Smart Dashboard this year, um, uh, but weren't very happy with the um, choices for that. So um, coming next year, I, I, I tend to monitor both Chief Delphi and the WPI Live GitHub uh, issues and pull requests. Um, <coughs> I've been seeing a lot of discussions, or was earlier in the summer, about a new browser-based dashboard effort um, that looks like it's going to be pretty nice. Um, I, I don't know how, how they're balancing diagnostic use versus competition use. Um, but we'll see uh, if it gets released. Um, and the good thing about it is that that we would finally have a dashboard that um, there was a group of people who were really enthusiastic about supporting. I have to say that the same is 
pretty much true of glass, that glass gets pretty good support. But it's, as I said, not appropriate as a competition textbook. Okay, so that's it for dashboards. Moving on to data logging. Um, if you've heard of flight data recorders for uh, airliners, this is the same idea. Um, it's, um, it's a way to get lots of data recorded in such a way that you can go back and, and look at it later. Um, and what's exciting is that as of 2023, WPI Lime, uh, data logging can, can, on the robot can happen with just two or three lines of code. Um, and I'll show you that code here in a second. Um, those two or three lines of code uh, cause everything that you put onto the dashboard via the smart dashboard class to appear in the data log. Also, with one line of code, in addition to the two base, one or two basic ones, you can log all of the inputs from the driver station. So uh, all of the uh, joystick inputs, uh, button presses, um, so on and so forth, uh, will get recorded in the same log along with everything else. You can go back later and um, look at uh, what happened. Um, the logs themselves uh, can go into the RoboRio onboard file system, or they can go on a USB drive that you plug into the RoboRio. And we like to use these, where is it? there it is. We like to use these little tiny, this one is SanDisk, um, uh, USB drives. Um, they don't get in the way of anything. And the other advantage of them is that they serve as a, a protective plug for the USB so that metal shavings and other things don't fall in there. So, so having things plugged into your USB ports is a good idea on the RoboRio. And a good thing to plug in is a little uh, flash drive uh, where uh, if you enable logging uh, and you have a flash drive plugged in, automatically go, go on with the flash drive. The other reason I like to use uh, the flash drive approach is because at competition, um, it's, it's kind of hard to get the um, data logs off of the RoboReal because you have to be plugged into it. Um, and so while the while the drive team and the pit crew were working on the robot between matches, I would go in and I would grab this, copy the files onto my computer and give it back to them. You could do it with two and it might, two drives and it might even work. Um, that's, that's fun. Um, so, so here's the code, uh, very, very simple. Um, data log manager dot start. That's all you got to do, and everything you put on the dashboard will will go in to the um, log. And if you want to log your uh, driver station control and joystick data, uh, driver station dot start data log data log manager dot get log. It's just kind of magic, but uh, really cool. All right. So once you have logs, uh, what do you do with them? So going back to uh, going back out of here and going back over to our VS Code window. If you go on there, uh, there's another tool called the Data Log Tool. Up it pops. Uh, we probably have to configure it. There we go. And you see that we have a list of all the log files and they are, they are uh, labeled or named with the time and date and called something .wpi, .wpi log. Uh, at competitions, these file names actually contain the match numbers, which is very slick. Um, I don't like one aspect of this tool, which is it's not possible to select all of the files at once uh, very easily. Um, but apart from that, uh, I think that might get fixed next year too. 
uh, you can automatically delete files after you download them, which is given that it's hard to select multiple files. Um, that's probably a good idea, but I'm also kind of paranoid about losing data, so I don't want to do that. Okay, so you can download them. Um, you can also, uh, so if you download one, This is where I, where I have this problem. Oh, it does have a select all. Hmm. Well, I'm not going to, not going to pursue that. But once you've done that, there are some tools for converting the log files into CSV files and so on and so forth. Um, that's turned out not to be our favorite way of doing things. Instead. Oh yeah, okay, great. Um, we have a video to show of something else we did with this tool. Um, uh, where am I? Okay, so analyzing the logs. Um, so the basic tool converts logs to spreadsheets and nothing much you can spreadsheet tools to analyze them. However, uh, Mechanical Advantage Team 6328 uh, has produced a really good tool for this called Advantage Scope. Um, and it, that actually goes along with something called Advantage Kit, which is an alternative logging package to the built-in one. We haven't used that, but Advantage Scope, Scope is really cool. You can graph values, zoom in and out, see illustrated operator controls, combine on-robot logs with driver station logs. So your driver station uh, records a log on your driver station computer uh, for every match as well. You can combine those and see what's going on with both perspectives simultaneously. And as I said earlier, it can be used as a live dashboard, but we didn't ever do this. So the question is, if I try to run this, um, find anything interesting. Kind of a big program. Start. Okay. Um, so, again, you're seeing this better than I am. So, um, do I have any logs? Out there. Uh, where did they go? It's not the right one. Not the game. I know there are some in here. These are actually not from our robot, but from another team um, trying to help out. So here's an example of where I collected um, the DS events and DS log from the driver station and the match log from the computer um, from the Robo Rio. Let's just go ahead and Open that. Takes a little while. Reads through the whole log. Again, it's not. This is this is actually a JavaScript program, so it takes a while. But then, in the left-hand menu, uh, you can see all the different things that have been collected from the driver station. Um, so 
don't know this as well as I know our robot, but okay, this is good. So applied output one, applied output two. This was their their arm. Um, notice that these are zero to one values, and the default uh, scale here is good. Um, but the currents are going to be not zero to one. And so by putting those on the right axis, we can have a different scale over on the right axis that corresponds to the current. So this was really nice. Um, and then similarly, um, where is it? Enable. Similarly, there, there's this ability to have discrete fields that tell you, in this case, when the robot was enabled and when it was disabled. And, and this looks like a very typical match, right? It starts with a, a long period where nothing is happening. Then there's 15, min, 15 seconds of autonomous, and then it's disabled for three seconds, and then um, tele up starts for the rest of the match. And so um, this team was having some trouble with um, some disconnects and uh, misbehavior of the CAN bus, and we were looking at their logs with them using this tool. So um, that's advantage scope, highly recommended. Um, probably be even better next year in ways that I don't know what they'll be because I'm not plugged into their development uh, processes, but uh, they've done a really marvelous job with that tool and it's very helpful. Okay, um, so uh, back to the here. Um, So Laura has another thing that we did with the um, with the uh, robot logs, which was very cool. Uh, one of our drivers actually had a personally owned GoPro camera that he attached on top of our robot. And then after the matches, he would post process those videos along with the driver station logs so we could see uh, what the driver and operator were doing um, Carl, do you wanna... throughout the match. And this, this was kind of important. important because our operator uh, would claim to be doing certain things and it was sometimes possible to prove that he wasn't. So <laughs> additional additional training was provided. <laughs> this also lets us look at that from a strategy perspective and say uh, see where you need to no, she's, i am not she's, muted it's she's... just because of how volume is working um it also helps us from a strategy perspective because we could look at where we lost time and what tasks could have been done at the same time like moving the arm and driving that maybe we weren't doing I'm going to share the video Believe I have this muted because I don't need to hear it. But this is here we go. So this is one of our qualification matches, I believe. So you can see the overhead view from um, Blue Alliance, and then the GoPro footage, and then in the bottom right, I believe you can see it. I've got some things covering it. You can see the driver and operator controllers and what is being pressed on each of those. So now we're entering teleops, they get more interesting. Looks like the one on the left is our driver oh, and the one on the right is our operator. Oh, and Wi-Fi is cutting out, but we kind of got the point of that. Okay. Okay, so you can see. So you guys can look at that. So you can look at, the link is in the chat, so you can take a look at it. Yep, and there's, Lots of different matches on there, practice matches, real matches. We competed with some of your teams on there. You might see you in the background. But that was really helpful for afterwards and for showing at demonstrations to show what the driver and operator do as well. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Um, so any, any questions? questions for either of us at this point? Um, we're we finished the prepared material we so. will be having a larger question and answer tomorrow for like not stuff that we covered just for general code so keep that in mind but 
right now, if you have questions about anything we talked about or somewhat related, that'd be great. So remember to unmute yourself and we'll call on you or put a question in the chat. Carl, do you see the chat? I can see the chat. Oh, there's a question. What is the current topic? <laughs> um, yes, uh, we just finished uh, talking about uh, driver stations and data logging. And this is all recorded, so we'll have it up on our YouTube and we'll send out the link to, I think we'll do each most of you. I'm not sure if to send out in all the channels, but if you want to make sure you get the link, put your email in the chat and I will make sure you get that. But Deegan, I believe I have yours. Also, if your team uses these tools in a different way, feel free to chime in. We'd be interested in learning something too and maybe showing a different perspective. So I, I think the plan is, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for giving us your email addresses. We'll we'll try to capture this chat record. Uh, it doesn't always work, um, but the the intention is to announce the links for the recordings broadly. So if you don't hear from us directly, um, you probably will see them over whatever uh, method, method that you found out about the. The workshops in the yeah, workshops. some of those I don't have continual access to, but I am copying down all these emails as well. Other questions? So do you want to tell people what's happening tomorrow and Wednesday, Lauren? Sure. So tomorrow we will be hearing from Kyle, who is one of our teammates. He's, I believe you can see him right now, he's on my camera, but he was on the call <laughs> earlier. And he's going to be talking about autonomous tools, I think specifically Pathweaver and Path Planner. Is that correct? I'll be briefly mentioning about those. Okay. And a couple other autonomous tools. He did pretty much all of our autonomous this year. And that will also touch on commands a little bit because they work together. And then we'll have a larger question and answer session. I think Sonic Squirrels are now on the call and we'll also be here for that. So if you want to bring code that you have questions about or anything we should have a longer time to answer questions about that and then wednesday do you, do you want to talk about what you'll be presenting then sure sounds good yeah. so we're okay we'll get to the question i is in here. I'm reading the question about autonomous programming uh homegrown copy of instead of great experience okay. so uh, yes yes okay, okay. um so um, so WPI Lib 2 versus uh, the older WPI Lib. Um, so um, what to say? <laughs> yes, we have we have quite good experience with WPI Lib 2. Um, um, yes, it is somewhat complicated, uh, but as you saw the the chaining capabilities um, that allow you to avoid having to create classes for everything, I think, are are a tremendous boon um, for teams. Um, having to create a class for every command is um, it is to me um, kind of confusing in the sense that it becomes very hard to find. It's already very hard to find the commands and exactly what they do. And if they're spread across a whole lot of different files, um, in each in their own class, um, with a lot of boilerplate around them, um, that seems uh, more difficult to me. I think there are also some some technical considerations about um, about WPI Lib uh, commands to regarding the way the scheduler works and the way uh, mutual exclusion of commands is implemented. Um, 
uh, again, they provide some conceptual uh, complication, but once you get your head around how it works, it's really not too bad. Um, as I said, the, the said earlier about when talking about the gotchas in program structure, um, this problem of having having uh, drive bases that don't have commands running on them and getting uh, getting the watchdog errors is pretty annoying, uh, but it's also kind of fundamental. Um, so um, as I understand it, uh, the old WPI live command structure is uh, was deprecated this year and is going away next year entirely, I think, but I don't know. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't pay that close attention to what's going on in that space. Um, I think the, the biggest, the biggest advice is choose something you're comfortable with, choose something that you can teach to students and use it to death. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, save, save exploration of new things for off seasons and, um, try, try on the robot to do things in, in the robot code itself, do things consistently, uh, whatever that is. Um, so anyway, that that's just a few random thoughts on that. Um, okay, okay. So it was already gone this year. Uh, all right, that doesn't surprise me. Um, I, I the other the other place that is that is um, perhaps affecting these decisions is whether you're using Java or C++. There are some things about this that are better in C++ and some things are better in Java. Um, we, we became a Java team in 2021 with infinite charge at home. Um, and we stayed with that since then, before that in C++. Uh, and the main motivation for switching was um, was just compilation time. Off-season experiments um, showed that the Java compilation time typically under 20 seconds, whereas our C++ compilation compilation times were in the minutes, in a few minutes to 10 minutes range. Uh, and what we found was that we could um, we could make so many more improvements to the, we could do so many more diagnostic and improvement cycles with Java that it was even better. So anyway, that's. Um... Cool, we don't have, while waiting for more questions, Kyush, did you wanna talk about Wednesday a little bit? Sure, yeah. So on Wednesday, 29.30, so Tim and I are gonna talk about kind of like our main programming advancements for this year. So kind of three main topics there. One of them is a sort of library we used, kind of why we recommend it, um, kind of how it helped us succeed. Second one is our, our integration advantage scope, advantage kit that helped us a lot this year. So talk about how we did that, kind of the practical benefits, um, how your team can kind of start doing that. And then third, kind of the biggest one is localization and using vision uh, to figure out where you are on the field and using that to do autonomous actions during teleop as well as autonomous. So it's kind of the three main topics there. Ooh, sounds great. Sounds really exciting. Hey, do we have any other questions or comments? So, so do uh, think about your comments uh, about questions for tomorrow night. Um, uh, we will, as Laura said, we will have time to answer questions um, uh, both on the topics from tonight and tomorrow night there's there's plenty of time for that and if you're prepared uh, with questions that would be great uh, because we'd love to be able to um, stick around and have good programming discussions with all of you um, for a full up to a full two full two hours if that's what we want to do and like i said if you have questions that we didn't cover that's great too maybe pull up coach can share we're happy to help with whatever we can. You know, between us and Sonic Squirrels, we should have a pretty wide variety of knowledge sets. 
So tomorrow night, uh, so tomorrow we're all going to be at our homes instead of here at uh, the lovely Palouse Discovery Science Center, which is our host for the summer. Um, and maybe you've been enjoying the murals on the walls behind us. Um, it's a pretty fun place. So if you're ever in uh, in Eastern Washington, drop by and say hi, and uh, we'd love to see you. Cool. So I think we will wrap up. Thank you for joining. Feel free to reach out. I think most of you probably have my contact information in some form or my teammate Daniels, but feel free to reach out if you need anything and we'll get the recordings to you all afterwards and we hope to see you tomorrow. Good night.